Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marco Ramos, and I'm one of the associate scientific directors for the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Thank you very much for joining us for our next installment of our regular CLSA webinar series. I'm very, very pleased to present our presenter today, Dr. Bill Leslie. Dr. Leslie is a professor of medicine and radiology at the University of Manitoba. He has over 300 peer-reviewed publications to his credit, and his research interests relate to fracture risk assessment, osteoporosis testing, and other nuclear diagnostic techniques. He's the president of the International Society for Clinical Densitometry, past chair of the Osteoporosis Canada Scientific Advisory Council, and he co-led the uh, 2010 Clinical Practice Guidelines in Osteoporosis Working Group. He's a director of the Manitoba Bone Density Program and co-director of the Winnipeg PET Imaging Centre. So uh, Dr. Leslie joins us from Winnipeg today and he's going to be presenting advances in fracture risk assessment. So just uh, for those of you who've never attended a uh, webinar uh, of CLSA before, uh, what we're going to do is everyone is muted and that is just so that uh, we don't get too much feedback on the microphones, which would happen if we uh, were unmuting everyone. So when it comes time for the question and answer period, I would please ask you to type your questions into the chat box, which is located at the lower left of the webinar screen, and I will read your questions to Dr. Leslie, and he will respond to them orally. So it'll be approximately 40 to 45 minute presentation, and then uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. So without further ado, um, welcome Dr. Leslie, and Bill, I turn the reins over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, and uh, thank you folks. Uh, uh, wherever you are for for uh, joining this session, uh, I will be speaking about a subject uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, uh, fracture risk assessment, and uh, uh, hope to have uh, plenty of discussion time uh, at the end. So uh, with that, uh, I will uh, uh, take you through the, the first part of the of this presentation. Um, this is a challenging uh, uh, situation for many. When we see patients, uh, the question arises to treat or not to treat. Uh, so the case scenario here, a 60-year-old woman, smoker, recurrent falls, with a hip T score of minus 2.4. And I can't ask for a show of hands uh, uh, across the country, uh, but this is the kind of situation that crops up uh, regularly in your offices and where the uh, the, the conundrum is that this individual is not quite osteoporotic by her T-score, but has additional risk factors. How do we factor that into the decision-making process? Uh, we're uh, aware that, uh, that BMD has been uh, an integral part of uh, risk assessment, osteoporosis diagnosis, and management uh, 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 well on uh, 20 years now. And for individuals over age uh, 50, we focus on the T-score, which is the number of standard deviations that bone density is above or below peak bone mass is defined at age 20 to 30 years. For individuals younger than 50, uh, we don't actually have a, a good framework for diagnosis of osteoporosis, and so we tend to focus on whether bone density is normal or uh, uh, below average for age. But uh, for the older individual, we have historically used the T-score to define normal bone density, low bone mass, formerly called osteopenia, or osteoporosis, and that has uh, been the framework around the diagnosis of osteoporosis and uh, treatment uh, guidelines for, uh, for a couple of decades. The problems with that approach, though, are outlined in this, uh, this slide. This is uh, data from, uh, uh, from Manitoba that Dan Cranny published, showing that uh, uh, if you look at the 
uh, fracture rate per thousand person years and you can uh, go from an individual with a bone density that's uh, uh, greater than zero, so better than average, better than my bone density, down to an individual who is uh, well down in the osteoporotic range, so very low bone density, that sure enough there is a gradient of increasing fracture risk as one goes from normal to very low bone density measurements. And uh, uh, that's uh, highlighted here when we go from normal to osteopenia to osteoporosis, there's no specific uh, uh, fracture threshold at which uh, fractures suddenly take off, but it's a, a continuous gradient of risk. Uh, that's good for bone density, but the problem with bone density is that if you actually superimpose the number of fractures in the population as shown in the bars here, you see that the numbers of fractures in the population tend to cluster uh, in the uh, uh, area of low bone mass or osteopenia because there just is, are not that many individuals with extremely low bone density, so they contribute a relatively small number of fractures to the overall population. So if one is uh, wedded to a T-score of minus 2.5 for treatment, one winds up missing the majority of individuals who will actually experience a major osteoporotic fracture because they actually happen to be in, uh, in have T-scores above that osteoporosis uh, cutoff. The uh, focus then moved in 2010 with the Osteoporosis Canada uh, Clinical Practice Guidelines to getting beyond a, a T-score approach to therapy and to a more holistic look at fracture risk assessment. And I would encourage readers to uh, uh, consult that, uh, that review, which was evidence-based and uh, uh, was uh, uh, many, many individuals contributed to that, uh, that particular document. Fundamental to this is the idea of 10-year fracture risk assessment. And this has been part of the Osteoporosis Canada uh, approach uh, uh, since 2005, but was formalized and integrated into the management uh, model in the 2010 guidelines. And fundamental to this are uh, two closely related uh, fracture risk assessment systems. One is the FRAC system, which I will be speaking about in great detail. And the other is the Canadian Os uh, Association of Radiologists Osteoporosis Canada System, or CAROC uh, for short. And they are actually built from the same uh, building blocks uh, and are very closely uh, aligned as a result. Uh, under either of these uh, frameworks, we look at 10-year fracture risk, and that's categorized as uh, low risk, uh, uh, less than 10% 10-year fracture risk, uh, defined as clinical spine, hip, uh, forearm or humerus fractures, and these are individuals who are uh, generally would be considered unlikely to benefit from pharmacotherapy, but where we would continue to monitor their fracture risk. At the other end of the spectrum are those individuals considered to be at high risk, and that means a 10-year fracture is greater than 20 percent, or uh, they could also be defined as higher risk based upon clinical features, uh, specifically uh, fractures involving the hip or spine that are low trauma fractures, or more than one low trauma fracture episode. That also defines a, a group of individuals who uh, would be considered high risk and where there is uh, our best evidence to date on the benefits of uh, pharmacotherapy to, to prevent uh, future fractures. And in between, in the range of 10 to 20 percent, a moderate risk group where guidelines are still evolving to provide guidance to uh, managing physicians, but where one of the focuses is on vertebral imaging because if we can identify a previously unrecognized vertebral fracture, either on x-ray or vertebral fracture assessment off of DEX if you happen to have that available, then of course a vertebral fracture automatically makes you high risk and so that would be a population that would be uh, uh, recommended for therapy. So let's look through those risk assessment systems and then uh, uh, go into the advances that have occurred since 2010. So the Canadian uh, FRAX uh, system uh, uh, is hosted through the uh, University of Sheffield uh, website. Uh, you can see that uh, there are many tools from different parts of the world. You select uh, a continent, you select a country, and uh, the Canadian uh, FRAX calculator uh, joined this uh, family of over 60 calculators in 2010, just in time for the launch of the Canadian guidelines. If you were to go to that website and uh, have a look at what uh, the calculator entails, you would see that, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll look at that in one second, 
but this, uh, this slide shows the importance of selecting the correct calculator. As I said, there are over 60 calculators. And uh, with identical inputs, changing the country uh, that one is looking at can have a dramatic effect on the calculated fracture risk. Uh, this looks at Canada, which happens to be in the relatively high risk uh, countries for osteoporotic fractures. And uh, so that a man or woman uh, with a T-score of minus 2.5, a prior fracture at age 65, would be, uh, if they're a woman, close to the 20% high, uh, high risk uh, for fracture, uh, a little less than that if, they were, if it was a man. You can see that getting the right calculator is critical. So uh, any uh, person uh, managing patients in Canada should use the Canadian uh, calculator, which has been, been specifically uh, built to reflect fracture epidemiology in Canada. Uh, the development of these systems is a two-stage process. So one of them uh, is to reflect the uh, fracture and mortality in the, uh, in the population. And uh, we had access to uh, uh, cross-Canada hip fracture data and mortality statistics for the purpose of uh, uh, calibrating the Canadian FRAX tool. And then there are uh, relative risk components to this. These are the clinical risk factors uh, that I'll show you on the next slide that uh, are uh, known to have similar effects in different populations. So if you're a smoker, it increases your risk of fracture by a certain uh, uh, amount, whether you're in Canada, the United States, or, uh, or Asia. And so these are the actual inputs into the uh, calculator. Uh, this is the Canadian calculator, but they all have the same, uh, same look. Uh, one enters age, sex, height, and weight for derivation of body mass index, and a few key uh, clinical risk factors, which are entered as yes, no, previous fracture, parental hip fracture, smoking, prolonged corticosteroid use, rheumatoid arthritis. There's a list of secondary osteoporosis causes, high alcohol use. And if you have it available to you, and hopefully you do, uh, BMD measured at the femoral neck, either as the BMD itself or as a T-score. And then entering those inf that information, pressing calculate, will lead to a calculation of the 10-year risk of uh, major osteoporotic fractures, which is, uh, uh, is critical in the Canadian uh, guidelines. Hip fracture risk is also calculated, but that does not have a specific role in the uh, Osteoporosis Canada guidelines. This uh, uh, FRAX calculator for Canada was uh, developed uh, and validated in many uh, uh, using two large um, uh, cohorts. One was the Canadian Multicenter Osteoporosis Study, and the other was the, uh, the Manitoba BMD cohort, which together uh, comprised uh, almost 45,000 individuals. And it was possible to take the uh, FRAX calculations and to look at uh, the, uh, uh, the performance of that calculator to see whether the predicted uh, risk of fracture actually agreed with the observed risk of, uh, of fracture in uh, samples that were independent from the national fracture data used to develop the model. And indeed, uh, you can see that the uh, dotted line of identity, which shows perfect uh, agreement between prediction and observation, shows a very good agreement for men and women across a, a, a range of uh, uh, risk categories. So uh, I'm pleased to say that the Canadian FRAX calculator has been uh, well validated in the, uh, the Canadian population. Closely aligned to the FRAX calculator is the Carox system that I referred to. This is a simplified version, uh, which still emphasizes uh, the, the same three risk categories, low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. And that is based upon age, sex, and the hip bone density measurements, so very much uh, like the FRAX calculator. Uh, but uh, it also uh, considers uh, two, two clinical risk factors, so it's simplified from FRAX. The two clinical risk factors are a fragility fracture after age 40, or uh, in the last year, prolonged corticosteroid use of uh, 7.5 milligram prednisone equivalent or uh, greater. Uh, it's easier to show how this system works than to actually describe it. And this is an example for a 65-year-old woman. Let's assume that her femoral neck T-score is minus 2.8, and she has no other uh, clinical risk factors. Then based upon uh, the, uh, the lookup table that accompanies this, the Carock tool, which also has a tabular version, you would see that her fracture was good plot uh, in the moderate risk category. So again, this is a categorical or semi-quantitative uh, method of risk assessment. 
if she actually happened to have either of those clinical risk factors that we referred to, prior fragility fracture or corticosteroid, that bumps her risk category up one for each clinical risk factor. So she was moderate risk to start with, and the presence of either of these would shift her up to the high risk category. And so this generally uh, gives uh, the kind of clinical guidance uh, that is necessary to use the uh, integrated uh, management framework from the Osteoporosis Canada 2010 guidelines. Uh, for those people that don't want to carry around a, uh, a lookup table or a graph, there's an app for that. You can go to the Osteoporosis Canada website, and there's a downloadable application that uh, gives you exactly the same results and uh, uh, doesn't require you to, uh, to uh, remember any of these, uh, these details. The uh, 2010 guidelines uh, were an update to the CAROC system that was ori originally re uh, launched in 2005. In 2005, uh, Canada was the first country to embrace absolute fractures based upon 10-year risk prediction for, uh, for risk assessment. Uh, that was a, uh, uh, a precursor to the current system. Again, it had the same uh, uh, layout, the same clinical risk factors. Uh, we did not have accurate Canadian fracture data at the time for calibrating the system, so we had to be reliant on uh, somewhat old, uh, outdated uh, Swedish fracture data, and we know that fracture rates have actually been going down globally, so uh, in conjunction with some other technical factors, this tended to, uh, to overrate uh, the uh, overestimate uh, risk assessment uh, in the Canadian population. It also was not uh, directly validated uh, uh, in the Canadian population. In contrast, the 2010 system uses the same layout, the same uh, uh, graphical uh, uh, display that people have come to, uh, to, uh, to know and love, same clinical risk factors. Uh, but because it's now derived from uh, Canadian uh, data, uh, and we have also made some additional uh, uh, technical corrections to the risk calculator, and been able to do the validation work we know that this actually uh, uh, does a very good job at assessing uh, risk of fracture in the Canadian population. So if we go back to uh, a sample here, a 65-year-old woman, T-score minus 2.8. Again, this is the same woman I showed you before. She was uh, moderate risk under the uh, CAROC system, under the FRAX calculator. Her 10-year risk is 13%, again, between 10 and 20%, so in the moderate risk range. If she had an additional risk factor uh, with the FRAX calculator, a prior fracture or steroids would uh, push up to 21%, which would be, have her in the high risk category. And again, as I said, either of those risk factors under the CAROC system would also make her high risk. So we have a good agreement between the FRAX and the CAROC uh, calculators for this particular individual. This is some of the validation work that was published around the uh, FRAX uh, versus the CAROC system, showing that uh, for low, moderate, or high, that the observed uh, risk of fracture, 10-year uh, risk of fracture on the y-axis, in fact, is less than 10%. 10 to 20 percent or greater than 20 percent with both the uh, FRAX and with the CAROC system. So again, the kind of stratification, the kind of calibration that you would uh, like to see. The nice thing about these two systems is that uh, they uh, were designed to give the same risk category uh, in uh, the great majority of individuals. 90% uh, of individuals actually have the same risk categorization under CAROC and FRAX. So the question that arises, can we do better than these risk calculators? So what's new on the horizon that, uh, that uh, might appear in, uh, in future guidelines? Well, part of some of this was addressed uh, at a, a, a joint position development conference between the International Society for Clinical Anatomy and the International Osteoporosis Foundation. That was held in Bucharest, Romania, uh, in 2010, and was published uh, by those two organizations in 2011. I'm not going to take you through the uh, the, the, re the recommendations, but for uh, for those of you that are interested in in uh, seeing this, they are published, and there are 20 specific recommendations on how to use the, uh, the FRAX uh, calculator in clinical practice. Examples of, uh, of enhancements to the original FRAX uh, system is uh, stratification by corticosteroid dose. So the original risk calculator on the FRAX website says uh, corticosteroid use, yes, no. 
but we know that there's going to be a dose response effect with higher doses giving higher risk and lower doses giving lower risk. And so John Canis uh, did, uh, was able to do some additional analysis and showed that you could, in fact, uh, modify the FRAX uh, output. Uh, so after you have the result, uh, to reflect the, uh, the difference between a, uh, a low corticosteroid dose versus a high corticosteroid dose. So that if you were a low dose user, you would reduce the FRAX uh, calculated risk by 20%. High dose user, you would increase it by about 15% for major fractures. And if you're in the intermediate dose range, of course, you would just use the FRAX output directly with a similar uh, adjustment applied for hip fractures. One of the conundrums is that uh, the only uh, bone density input to FRAX is the T-score from the femoral neck. And we know that in clinical practice, the lumbar spine is often used. So what do you do when the lumbar spine uh, BMD is uh, significantly uh, different, specifically lower than the femoral neck uh, T-score? Uh, and so uh, a, a methodology for adjusting the FRAX score based upon the number of standard deviations difference between the T-score at the femoral neck and lumbar spine was uh, was developed. Uh, we actually developed uh, that in uh, Manitoba, but it's been subsequently validated in the uh, uh, Canadian population and in international meta-analysis and was adopted by ISCD and IOF as a, uh, uh, a procedure that could be used to accommodate the lumbar spine in the risk assessment uh, uh, framework under FRAX. And so how big of a difference does it make? Well, this is an example of that. 70-year-old asthmatic woman with a T-score of minus 2.0, uh, spine, uh, spine T-score minus 3.5 on relatively high dose uh, uh, glucocorticoid. Uh, using the FRAX calculator, which does not consider the lumbar spine or the steroid dose, her risk comes out at 16%, uh, which would be uh, in the moderate risk range. But if you incorporate the, uh, the adjustment uh, based upon uh, the spine uh, uh, T-score uh, uh, as well as the higher steroid dose, in fact, her risk gets recalculated as 21%, so she would be designated high risk. And so this is an example of how uh, these additional modifiers can be considered in FRAX. Another uh, advance that's uh, uh, occurred is in the assessment of risk in individuals uh, on treatment, because there is some concern that in individuals who uh, are receiving uh, 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 treatment for osteoporosis, that maybe these risk calculators are, uh, cannot be used. We did an analysis in uh, uh, a large number of women, uh, uh, who, uh, some of whom were on therapy. We were able to link this through pharmacy records. And uh, this uh, graph shows the calibration uh, in the untreated individuals in the gray area versus individuals on treatment, looking at different levels of, uh, of adherence and uh, uh, on in the lines. And you can see they all fall within the, uh, the, uh, the area of 95% confidence for the calibration of FRAX. And in fact, in our detailed analyses, we could not show any adverse effect of treatment on the FRAX predictions uh, uh, in our analysis. So suggesting that maybe there is a possibility of using uh, um, the FRAX calculator to predict risk in individuals on therapy. Now, does that mean that we're predicting the risk reduction on therapy? And the answer is absolutely not. We have to distinguish from that. The, uh, we did a follow-up study where we looked at individuals uh, on therapy to see whether the change in their risk on treatment was, uh, was useful uh, with the FRAX calculator. We looked at over 11,000 individuals who had two uh, uh, FRAX risk calculations, again, able to link their pharmacy records so we knew who was initiating therapy, what their adherence was. And uh, unfortunately, you can see that uh, in the figure here, those people that did not initiate therapy, their risk of uh, a fracture went up over time. This is the change, that's the change in their risk assessment to actually increased. Those people that started therapy and took a little bit of drug, but less than 50% of the time, their risk still went up. Those people that took 50 to 80% of their medication, their risk went up. And even those people that took the highest level of, uh, of medication, over 80% compliant, their risk still went up. 
And if you think about it for a moment, you realize that, of course, uh, age is a, a component of the FRAX calculation. Uh, even if your bone density stabilizes or improves, and that should uh, uh, stabilize or improve your, uh, your risk assessment, aging does not stop. And uh, so your risk of fracture will continue to increase, maybe a little slower on therapy. Uh, but it means that the, that the FRAX risk calculator is not going to be a good indicator of on-treatment uh, risk reduction. Well, we've been very DEXA focused on to this point, but we know that, uh, that uh, DEXA measures bone density, but there's an awful lot uh, of other stuff that goes on in the skeleton that contributes to skeletal strength uh, that uh, DEXA uh, does not directly measure or uh, has not been used in clinical practice. And so the uh, International Society for Clinical Densitometry earlier this year held a physician development conference where we looked at the use of, uh, of DEXA and CT to assess uh, fracture risk, but looking beyond bone density measurements, can we use other uh, metrics that are derived from, uh, from DEXA and, uh, and CT to, arrest, to assess fracture risk that would be complementary to, uh, to the BMDT score? And so uh, these are the three primary topics addressed. We looked at trabecular bone score, which I'll talk about in some detail, a measure of bone texture, geometric measures derived from the hip, uh, specifically hip structure analysis and hip axis length. And there were also detailed uh, discussions on, uh, on uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, quantitative CT finite element analysis and opportunistic screening based upon CT scans, which uh, uh, I will not be touching on uh, uh, today. So let's look at trabecular bone score. This has been uh, very topical in the last uh, few years. Uh, TBS is uh, basically a texture measurement that can be derived for lumbar spine DEXA images. It's a specialized software. You can, uh, uh, it's approved by the FDA. You can get a, a license for it and it allows you to analyze the uh, region of interest in the lumbar spine that's used for the BMD measurement. And then it comes out with a, a measure of, uh, of the, uh, the bone texture, which is a reflection of uh, bone structure that correlates with the bone strength. A higher TBS measurement implying uh, better preserved bone structure and a low TBS measurement implying worse or uh, in the parlance of, uh, of t TBS degraded uh, bone structure. And the principles are uh, uh, sort of very simplified here, but uh, a well-structured bone has lots of uh, variation, uh, pixel to pixel to pixel, and that's what TBS measurements. Whereas in a uh, uh, osteoporotic bone, there's a loss in the variation at small distances, so you lose that, uh, that, uh, that complex structure and texture, and uh, that results in a lower TBS measurement. Now, the correlation between BMD and TBS is actually quite poor. So you can see individuals, like in this example, that have identical bone density measurements, but where the TBS measurements can be uh, quite, uh, quite different. So it has the potential to provide uh, complementary information. So the questions addressed uh, by the uh, ISD panel was uh, the use of TBS in clinical practice for initiation of treatment for monitoring purposes and uh, whether there were special con uh, conditions where TBS might have uh, greater value. This is a summary slide that looks at uh, the longitudinal studies that assessed uh, uh, prediction of uh, osteoporotic fractures in postmenopausal women. Uh, these studies uh, varied from the largest study from uh, Manitoba with 29,000 women to a study from Japan that had uh, uh, 600 women or a study from, uh, from France that had uh, just over 500. But the important uh, point is not the specific uh, uh, results uh, from the assessments, but, but the fact that uh, all of them, uh, uh, after adjustment for risk factors, uh, showed a significant uh, uh, difference from the null effect uh, or a hazard ratio of one in terms of predicting an increased risk in both vertebral fractures, hip fractures, any or major osteoporotic fractures. So that there was uh, 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 predictive information in, uh, in the TBS measurement in terms of uh, uh, any of those types of fractures. Uh, 
recently, in fact, uh, just uh, within the last few weeks, a large meta-analysis uh, appeared using 14 prospective studies. You can see now a large number of men, a large number of women were uh, in this uh, in this cohort, uh, contributing a large number of hip fractures and major osteoporotic fractures. And the objective here was to develop a, a something that uh, uh, would be complementary to the use of FRAX. So the FRAX uh, was uh, one of the uh, adjusting uh, uh, covariates. And the important thing is that for major osteoporotic fractures and hip fractures in both men and women with equal strength, uh, each standard deviation reduction in TBS led to an increase in fracture probability of somewhere between uh, 27 and 35 percent which may not sound like a lot, but it's very comparable to the other clinical risk factors in FRAX. And this is now information that is complementary or independent of the FRAX calculator. Uh, the question of whether TBS might be useful as a, uh, as a uh, monitoring tool has been addressed. Uh, uh, unfortunately, TBS seems to be very unresponsive to currently available treatments, especially the bisphosphonates. In gray is the change in uh, lumbar spine BMD that you see with the bisphosphonate or teriparatide in one of these uh, slides, uh, uh, bars versus in blue, the change in TBS. And you can see that across the board, the change on therapy in TBS is considerably smaller than the change in, uh, in, uh, uh, in BMD, suggesting that TBS may actually not be a useful tool for monitoring purposes. Diabetes has been of uh, great interest because we know that the uh, diabetes is not a risk factor in the FRAX tool and data from several studies, uh, including the, uh, the study from uh, Laura Jan Gregorio, have shown that the FRAX calculator, although well calibrated as seen by the alignment between the dotted line and the calibration curve in non-diabetic individuals, underestimates fracture risk in those individuals who are diabetic as seen in the, in the blue line and that applies to both major osteoporotic fractures and hip fractures. So is TBS useful in diabetes? And the answer is, it just may be. And if you look at the BMD measurements, we know that uh, BMD tends to be higher in individuals with type 2 diabetes. And so this large study from Manitoba found, indeed, that all of the BMD measurement sites we looked at uh, were significantly higher in the diabetic versus the non-diabetic individuals, even when you adjusted for BMI and other risk factors. Interestingly, lumbar spine TBS was significantly lower in those people in, uh, in, uh, that had diabetes. And because diabetes acts as a risk factor for fracture, this suggests we may be able to capture some of that information. And so when we looked at, uh, at the prediction of fracture with uh, TBS adjusted for uh, other uh, uh, covariates, we showed that lumbar spine TBS, in fact, uh, did predict fractures in individuals with diabetes with a hazard ratio of uh, 1.27, virtually identical to the individuals without diabetes with a hazard ratio of 1.31, and that uh, about half of the information uh, uh, attributed to uh, diabetes as a risk factor in the model was captured uh, by TBS. So it captures some, although not all, of the uh, diabetes-associated risk. Um, so the recommendations from the ISCD was that TBS was associated with uh, fracture risk in older women and in, uh, in men. Uh, should not be used alone to determine treatment, was not useful for monitoring, uh, what had uh, uh, value in individuals with type 2 diabetes. But the most important thing was the final point that TBS can be used in association with FRAX to adjust fracture probability in older women and men. And so this is the, uh, the study that, uh, that uh, supported that statement, uh, that uh, when uh, you look in, uh, in red at the, uh, uh, the association between TBS adjusted for FRAX clinical risk factors and bone density, that it was a significant contributor uh, for hip fractures, for other osteoporotic fractures, and for mortality, which of course, as you'll recall, is part of the FRAX framework because competing mortality does uh, protect against uh, future risk of, uh, of death. And when the, uh, the uh, uh, folks at, uh, in Sheffield put all that together, they came up with the uh, TBS adjustment to FRAX that's uh, published in the McCloskey paper and that is uh, reproduced here so that you can 
program this onto Excel if you wanted, uh, or, but you can see that this has, uh, has a specific uh, term in here uh, for TBS by age. The TBS by age uh, term is very important because it captures the fact that TBS has a greater importance in younger than older individuals. So if you look at the magnitude of the adjustment uh, that would occur uh, to uh, an individual whose uh, baseline risk of fracture was, say, 12.5% major osteoporotic fracture or 2.5% for a hip fracture, uh, if their TBS measurement is at the uh, 10th percentile, that increases their risk for fracture. If it's at the 90th percentile, it re uh, reduces their risk for fracture. But that adjustment is much stronger in individuals who are younger than individuals who are older. Uh, and that, uh, is, uh, that effect is captured by the, uh, that age by TBS interaction term. So if you've been to the FRAX website recently, you may have noticed that there's a new uh, button that's appeared. It's called Adjust with TBS. So if you have uh, a TBS measurement, you can click that button. And it will take you to a page. You enter in the TBS measurement. And now you can get a FRAX adjusted or a TBS adjusted FRAX probability that does all of these calculations for you. The next thing that the ICD panel looked at was uh, uh, bone geometry. Uh, this has been available uh, for over 20 years and uh, uh, goes by the term hip structural analysis or advanced hip analysis on uh, different genders. And it looks to things like uh, dimensions around the femoral neck, uh, the hip axis length uh, is shown in green, uh, the uh, neck shaft angle is seen in magenta. Parameters have been around for a long time, but we haven't actually known if they were useful for, uh, for risk prediction. Uh, so the uh, panel addressed those, address those questions. Can these geometry measures predict fracture risk? Can they be used for treatment purposes? Can they be used for monitoring purposes? Uh, there was a paucity of uh, data in, uh, in men and limited data in uh, women. This is a summary of some of the, uh, of the uh, uh, adjusted odds ratios, uh, which went from very weak effects to very strong effects. And it was really all over the map, uh, probably because many of the studies were underpowered. Uh, so uh, to inform this discussion, we did a large-scale analysis in the Manitoba cohort where we identified 50,000 women, 10,000 of them had incident hip fractures, and we were able to simultaneously look at uh, the, uh, the risk of all of these clinical, uh, these uh, geometric parameters uh, adjusted for the uh, FRAX probabilities and showed that, in fact, all of them, as seen in bold face here, were predictive of hip fractures. Uh, if you adjusted for BMD in the model, some of them no longer were important uh, because BMD was such a strong contributor to those, uh, those risk uh, calc uh, measurements like the cross-sectional area and cross-sectional moment of inertia. Basically, it's all captured by the BMD measurement. Uh, but interestingly, three of them continued to be uh, quite interesting, hip axis length, neck shack angle, buckling ratio. And when we evaluated those simultaneously, we found of those, the most robustly associated with hip fracture risk was hip axis length. So hip axis length is uh, interesting because it's so easily measured off of a DEXA image. And this looks at the degree of stratification that we saw from the lowest, uh, uh, the shortest hip axis length to the smallest quintile to the, to the uh, longest hip axis length to the longest quintile, showing really a more than twofold uh, variation in hip fracture risk across the physiologic range of hip axis uh, length. And uh, so the, uh, the uh, ISCD positions uh, uh, basically highlighted the importance of hip axis length as a, a parameter that can predict uh, risk in uh, women, uh, that the other geometric parameters were actually not useful uh, for risk assessment. None of these are, are, are going to be treatment responsive because, of course, it's geometry. And so you can't uh, initiate uh, treatment on them solely or use them for monitoring purposes. Now, uh, that was then, and this is now. Uh, more data uh, just, uh, just published where we were able to actually look at men. And we showed that uh, the, uh, in, in black compared to orange, that the hip axis length actually gives you the same 
uh, risk for hip fracture in men as it, as it does in women, which is nice because now we have uh, something to use uh, uh, in, uh, in both genders. And uh, we were able to develop a, uh, uh, a methodology that would allow you to integrate that into the FRAX risk assessment based upon uh, how far an individual's uh, hip axis length differs from, uh, from average for their sex. And uh, I'll refer, refer you to the publication in the interest of time, but to show you that uh, uh, for every a millimeter increase or decrease in hip axis length, then you can apply a relatively simple adjustment to the FRAX probability, 4% uh, to 5% per millimeter, and that can actually have quite a large effect on the hip fracture risk in an individual between the 10th and the 20th, uh, uh, sorry, between the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile, almost doubling the, uh, the hip fracture uh, risk. Uh, I won't touch on finite element analysis, but uh, that is uh, probably the future of risk assessment in uh, bone dense cytometry. This has historically been an engineering uh, technique uh, that uh, we used to build bridges, but of course the analogy with, uh, with bone is uh, fairly obvious. Uh, there have been, this has been uh, widely used in quantitative CT, but there is now interest in, uh, in developing this uh, technology for DEXA. So we may be seeing something uh, useful in that line in the next uh, uh, year or two. The group in Sheffield has been very uh, uh, forward in that work. So I'll close with uh, some, uh, some crystal ball gazing about uh, uh, where, what the next gen risk assessment might look like and where the uh, uh, CLSA may be uh, uh, contributory. Um, we have uh, uh, a huge uh, data set of uh, bone density measurements, including hip dexa from CLSA. And so this may be helpful to address questions like, uh, FRAX versus other calculators that uh, have, uh, have been developed. One of those from Australia, the Garvin calculator, incorporates uh, falls and numbers of fractures, and uh, many people think that that is, uh, is very attractive, but it hasn't been uh, compared with FRAX in a, in a large cohort, uh, and uh, CLSA uh, captures all of the essential ingredients needed for both the FRAX calculation, the Garvin calculation, so a head-to-head -head comparison uh, to those algorithms or whatever else uh, appears on the horizon would be very attractive. Body composition, sarcopenia uh, clearly contribute to frailty, falls, and fracture. And so again, uh, CLSA has the world's largest cohort of total body DEXA uh, measurements, which allows you to derive body composition and appendicularly mass, which is part of the definition for, uh, for sarcopenia. And so again, a tremendous opportunity for, for CLSA. Uh, vertebral fracture assessment to look at occult vertebral fractures has been part of uh, CLSA, and again, this will be the largest uh, uh, data set of that uh, uh, methodology uh, uh, in the world. Uh, in the next wave, it's hoped that uh, Spindex will be incorporated in the CLSA measurements, and so this creates opportunities both to look at the spine hip uh, discordance uh, adjustments that I, I spoke about, and also to look at uh, spine uh, uh, TBS, uh, because uh, uh, as you can see, that really is a very exciting uh, new development in the field of, uh, of, uh, of DEXA. So with that, I'll close with uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, the Stone Age was marked by man's clever use of crude tools. The information age to date has been marked by man's crude use of clever tools. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, clever tools out there. We're hoping to be able to make uh, better use of them in clinical management. And uh, I think that uh, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that that, uh, that is the direction that Osteoporosis Canada has been uh, uh, charting over the last uh, uh, decade. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Bill, for a very excellent and informative presentation not being from the clinical world myself, I always find these types of presentations very interesting because these days research is so multidisciplinary. So non-clinical people like me really have to understand the clinical perspective. So uh, we have about 15 or so minutes and we will entertain questions from the audience. As I said at the outset, 
please type your questions into the chat feature, and I will uh, then um, read them out to uh, the rest of us, and Bill will be able to answer. To get the ball rolling, I have a couple of questions. And uh, first question, uh, coming from an epidemiologic perspective, we like to think about uh, external and internal validity. And when I think of external validity, I think of the extent to which the results from CLSA could be generalized to other populations. So to uh, Americans or people in the United Kingdom. And so I guess, Bill, thinking back to uh, what you concluded with, with your crystal ball, um, do you think that the CLSA's results could easily apply to populations in other countries outside of Canada? So I'll, uh, I'll I'll speak based upon my experience with uh, with uh, with the Frax and Caroc tools. Um, uh, there, there's no question that there are uh, population differences in the uh, in the epidemiology of, of fractures. We see that dramatically in uh, the developed uh, versus the developing world. But uh, at the same time, I see uh, many uh, uh, many commonalities and similarities, and especially in the, in, in North America, the uh, 49th uh, parallel really is uh, is not uh, is just a line on a map. It does not reflect any intrinsic differences uh, between uh, uh, the populations. So when we've uh, looked at the performance of the Canadian Frax calculator. Uh, we actually also looked at the uh, the U.S. Frax calculator in the Canadian population. It was uh, uh, virtually identical in terms of its calibration and uh, performance. Uh, those uh, calculators are around for hip fracture risk, which is built upon very solid epidemiology, showed virtually identical results for the uh, Australia, New Zealand, France, and uh, UK calculators. So I think that there are certainly a uh, pretty good argument that, uh, that there are uh, more similar similarities than differences in, in, uh, in these historically uh, uh, European-derived uh, populations. Um, we're getting a little, the, the, the evidence uh, for other uh, 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 similarities to, to populations are maybe uh, more uh, relative similarities than absolute similarities. So the, uh, uh, the meta-analyses that have been done uh, with uh, with fracs for the clinical risk factors and the uh, the skeletal measurements have not to date shown that there is a substantial difference in the relative risks uh, in the uh, uh, North American, European, or Asian populations. So there were actually Asian populations in the TBS meta-analysis, and they did not uh, uh, did not look any different in that population than in the uh, the Canadian population. So I think that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, population differences, although they clearly exist, do not uh, preclude uh, um, generalization from CLSA to, to other, Great, other thanks. countries. Uh, other, one other, other question, areas. and then we have uh, a question in the chat feature that I'll read out. Um, what are the, um, again, thinking epidemiologically about longitudinal studies, what, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with KMOS. If you are, what do you think are the major differences between um, how CLSA can inform osteoporosis research versus KMOS? I have been involved with uh, with KMOS, the Canadian Multicenter Osteoporosis Study, uh, since uh, uh, the mid 1990s. So um, I think uh, KMOS is, is clearly uh, an enormous contribution to uh, our understanding of osteoporosis and fracture epidemiology in Canada, uh, but it's also been a, a, an international contributor uh, in the uh, in the TBS meta analysis that I referred to. KMOS contributed to that and was the largest largest uh, single cohort contributing to uh, to uh, to that uh, that analysis the advantage to KMOS is that it's very specific to the to the areas of osteoporosis and uh, 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 
uh, fracture. Uh, it's got an enormous lead time now. We're uh, uh, 17 years of, uh, of uh, follow-up data. So uh, it's got, a, uh, although not as large as CLSA, uh, it does have a, a head start and uh, uh, is, uh, um, is very granular in terms of the detail around osteoporosis risk factors, uh, whereas CLSA is a much uh, broader uh, um, um, framework for, 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 uh, for health assessment. What I think the LSA offers uh, that uh, tremendous uh, opportunity in the osteoporosis field is the, the body composition. Uh, again, sarcopenia being uh, a very uh, hot topic in the field of uh, fracture risk assessment right now, and also for deeper fracture assessment, uh, which was not uh, systematically part of, uh, of KMOS. So I think those are uh, uh, both the size of the CL uh, CLSA as well as those uh, unique uh, contributions to the skeletal measurements uh, will complement uh, uh, KMOS. Uh, so a question from the audience. Dean writes, thank you for presenting on this topic, Bill. When looking at hip structure measurements such as CSMI, were such measures derived using a mass or density weighted computations? Well, Dean, thank you for such a specific detailed question. And uh, I can't remember exactly uh, um, how that was uh, was calculated. Um, the, uh, uh, in, in our analysis, we used the, uh, the GE Lunar uh, Advanced Hip Analysis AHA routine. Um, uh, when we get off the call, I'll send you uh, Ken Faulkner's uh, paper where they describe that, and uh, hopefully uh, 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 you'll find the answer there. I'm sorry okay. I, don't, uh, so I don't know So I think that Dean it says that he's typing up another question, entering a chat message. Maybe Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not seeing it here, so... Okay, I think that he's typing something else, so we'll give him a minute or, a minute or two to type. Uh, if there are any other questions uh, from the audience, then uh, by all means, go ahead. Uh, one question that I can ask you, uh, in CLSA, we're not sending our participants to get in-depth physical exams by specialist physicians. So. Um, uh, no quote-unquote bone doctor is going to look at any of our participants to assess the presence of uh, osteoarthritis or osteoporosis or anything like that. Instead, we're using algorithms. Uh, we're taking bits and bobs of CLSA data and combining them together to come out with uh, a ruling in or a ruling out as to whether or not someone um, might have a disease. So are you familiar? Uh, with any literature on the extent to which uh, self-report versus clinical diagnosis, uh, the extent to which they agree or disagree? I'm not, and that, that's it'll be interesting actually to see how those uh, those algorithms work. I was, you know, part of the uh, of, of the group uh, providing some some input uh, into that. Uh, but uh, um, it was uh, it was uh, more intuitive than evidence based. Uh, there's there's uh, there's no question. Um, so I think that would be actually a, a, an early analysis that would be a, a quite quite a, quite interesting to look at. Uh, other studies that have asked people their recollection on, for example, bone density reports uh, suggest that uh, uh, that they they may not do uh, a great job. That their recollection uh, for uh, osteoporotic bone density is uh, better, but uh, but uh, if they say uh, normal or osteopenic, they generally uh, there's uh, they don't do as good a job. Okay, and, and certainly that's what I, my understanding is that uh, even for very serious chronic disorders, people tend to misclassify themselves. 
another question from Dean. How important do you think accounting for differences in BMD and hence material strength are in deriving outcome measures that can be used to augment instruments such as FRACs? Okay, just read that again. How important are, okay, let me just look at this. Differences in BMD and material strength. So um, I'm not sure if this is the, the, the intent of the question, uh, but uh, 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 BMD as a as a uh, as a crude measure of uh, of uh, skeletal strength, not material properties, but uh, skeletal strength, uh, clearly is uh, is a very uh, uh, strong risk factor for uh, for fracture. But a lot of the clinical risk factors in uh, in the FRAX tool are also uh, very strong, including uh, age, uh, prior fracture, and interestingly, a parental hip fracture, uh, independent of bone density, is a very strong uh, contributor. So we have actually done a comparison of the FRAX uh, calculator uh, when used without BMD versus when it is used with BMD to see uh, uh, how important uh, BMD is as a contributor to that, uh, that uh, uh, risk assessment. Uh, based upon uh, the 20% cutoff for defining uh, high risk, uh, we showed that the uh, area under the curve using FRAX without BMD to predict 20% uh, risk or greater uh, for uh, FRAX uh, uh, used with BMD, uh, the AUC was about uh, was greater than 0.9. The same thing for using uh, uh, the HIP uh, FRAX calculator to predict a 3% a, a uh, uh, risk. So. Uh, that would apply that uh, that BMD uh, is a, is important, but uh, for the majority of the population, you can actually do a fairly good job in risk assessment uh, using clinical risk factors without BMD. Where it makes a big difference uh, is in you know, for for treatment purposes is when the BMD is close to the uh, or your risk is close to the uh, the treatment threshold. So the, those individuals that uh, where if you were going to treat at 20 percent but you're in the 15 to 25 percent range, the BMD makes a big difference. If you're outside of that range, uh, much less of, uh, Great, of, thanks, uh, of an effect. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm not, okay. no, no, I was just going to say, so I answered a I'm question, sure whether that was Dean's question or not, I have no idea. Follow up if there's any further queries. Oh, he says thanks, so maybe you did answer it, yeah. Well, great, I think we're coming up to the end of our time and I don't see any other um, questions being entered. Uh, thank you, Bill, very much for this excellent presentation. We all at CLSA uh, appreciate uh, taking uh, the time to present this material to us. Uh, very interesting once again. And uh, again, thank you very much. Great. So uh, no, we thank do you. try and have uh, webinars uh, every month except for uh, July and August when people tend to be on vacation. So just a couple of plugs for uh, the next couple of webinars. They're both going to be international. Um, in December, December the 9th from 12 to 1 Eastern Time, Dr. Par Paul Loprinzi from the United States is going to talk about factors that influence physical activity and the effects of physical activity on cardiovascular risk factors and health outcomes in middle to old age adults. And that actually um, segues nicely into another international based webinar. It's going to be on January 21st at noon Eastern Time. Diana Ku from the United Kingdom is going to be talking about the life course perspective in epidemiology and she is one of the uh, seminal thinkers in the area of studying epidemiology from a life course. So that will be very interesting, these next two uh, webinars. And so we hope to see you there. And thanks again, Bill. And I wish everyone a nice afternoon.